Today is Sunday, May 30th. The year is 2021. This is No Easy Answers, and I am your host, Jules Taylor. Today, like all days, I have no easy answers for you. Well, thank you for tuning in from wherever you happen to be listening. My name is Jules Taylor. This is No Easy Answers, and I am delighted to have you with us for today's episode. As you probably know, No Easy Answers is a podcast about politics, philosophy, and the human condition. We are entirely listener-supported, so we entrust our listenership to keep us going, so you're not going to hear any ads or commercials except for me asking you to subscribe to our Patreon page. We might end up putting some bonus content, you know, behind a paywall someday, but for now... Nothing. Uh, today is not that day. Nothing is we do is behind a paywall. I feel very strongly that the content and conversations I'm presenting are things that can be enriching for listeners, and hopefully they give you something that you can take away from them that enhances your way of being in the world. So I don't want to place any of that behind any sort of barrier. Um, short of a monetary donation, you can help us grow and reach a wider audience by leaving us a five-star review in Apple Podcast or Audible. We're on that platform, too. Or, you know, sharing these episodes on your social media. You can follow the podcast on Twitter. You can like our Facebook page. And you can even join the conversation on our Reddit or Discord. Links to all that stuff are in the show notes. And as always, you can email your comments, concerns, criticisms, or vitriol to noeasyanswerspodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to all of our patrons who make this show possible. It's because of you I'm able to continue writing, researching, interviewing, and producing content. And we quite literally could not do this without you. So, on to today's episode. I have invited Dr. Richard Polt to speak with us about the philosopher Martin Heidegger. If you listen to episode 29, I mentioned a bit about Heidegger and his concept of authenticity, but today we're going to take a deep dive into Heidegger, his philosophy, and the events that shaped his life and his work. Dr. Polt is the author of a few books on Heidegger, and the one that I've been making my way through is called Time and Trauma, Thinking Through Heidegger in the 30s. Of course, Heidegger is a controversial character in that he joined the Nazi party in 1933, and many folks feel like this left an indelible stain on his philosophical work. Some critics are more eager to attach the actual philosophical substance of his work to Nazism, while others feel there is room for separation of his political action and his philosophical thoughts. What is uncontested is Heidegger's lasting influence on philosophy, helping to shape some of the thoughts of existentialists like Jean-Paul Sartre and postmodernists like Jacques Derrida. Heidegger is also a philosopher that is cited by both sides of the political aisle. So this conversation is also a part of a greater inquiry the arch of this podcast is taking in that we are attempting to examine the psychological, cognitive, and logical workings of the far right. It seems there would be a great deal of insight to be gained by making our way through some of these key thinkers. I want to send a huge thank you to Dr. Richard Polt for having this conversation with me. He really helped illuminate a great deal of Heidegger's thought, a lot of which comes out of Heidegger's seminal work of Being in Time, which is an impenetrable text if you just try to pick it up and read it without any context. Dr. Polt's book not only manages to explain some of these Heideggerian philosophical concepts, but also there's a great deal of history surrounding all of this. So the book is remarkable in that it provides some insight that allows you to not only be able to absorb the otherwise unbreachable text of being in time, but it paints a picture of Heidegger as a person and how his philosophical work came to have influence in politics. If you listen to episode 30, then you'll recall my conversation with Dr. Benjamin Teitelbaum, in which we spoke about how non-political ideologies or belief systems come to embody their own political implications. Links to Dr. Polt's Twitter account, as well as his book, Time and Trauma, Thinking Through Heidegger in the 30s, are in the show notes. So let's get to our interview with Dr. Richard Polt. So, 
I'm really excited about this conversation and I can't thank you enough for, you know, lending your time and expertise to help us uh, sort through some of these things, you know. Um, I, I, maybe I should ask to, to get started, um, maybe you could introduce yourself to our audience and, and tell us uh, how you came to uh, fixate on Heidegger and his philosophy. Yeah, well, I hope I'm not too fixated. But, <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Richard Poles. I'm currently, a, I have been for, for quite a few years, a professor at Xavier University, uh, Jesuit University in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I first heard of Heidegger when I was um, a junior in college and was intrigued by a few remarks uh, professors made and then got to take a class about being in time as a senior and uh, just found it to be very thought provoking, very deep, full of good questions. And, and I was also sympathetic to the a lot of angles Heidegger was taking. So, so that's been the main um, focus of my research. I've done uh, articles, books, translations, and anthologies relating to Heidegger. Um, as I said, I hope I'm not totally fixated, so I'm try trying to think a little more creatively, too. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, because, like, I, your book really hit a spot that I was curious about, because I, you know, I've noticed in some of my research, I mean, this podcast covers politics, philosophy, and the human condition, and, uh, you know, ultimately, we take a my politics are very on the left. I guess you could call me, you know, I, I wouldn't argue with being called a communist or a socialist. Um, but I, it, my interest in this kind of came from a thought that, you know, the left and the right sort of share philosophical heroes, um, mainly like Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Schmidt. And, um, and so in terms of Heidegger, he seems kind of like the most redeemable character. I mean, Nietzsche wasn't like obviously a uh, he was around and uh, he was around before the uh, National Socialism and stuff like that. So I'm not trying to parse out whether Nietzsche was uh, a fascist or anything to that end. Um, but there are lots of questions I have about Heidegger because I, on the one end, I don't I don't think we we have any sort of um, you know, above the surface remarks from Heidegger that would give us an insight into his personal beliefs or feelings in regards to his political action, or at least I'm not aware of any of those statements or anything that would put Heidegger in a camp of severe sort of irredeemability. I mean, I know that he joined the Nazi party in 1933, um, but, but in an effort of kind of sorting through all of that stuff, um, I began reading uh, Being in Time and quickly found uh, it was a difficult text to breach uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and, and I think uh, your interviews in the past with like the uh, uh, the new books in critical theory or new books in, in, in phenomenology or what have you, that podcast network, uh, your interviews have helped me gain some insight into why that was difficult and kind of make more sense of it. And, and ultimately, I was able to absorb more of Being in Time after listening to your interviews and reading through some of your book, uh, which is Time and Trauma, uh, Thinking Through Heidegger in the 30s. So uh, it, it, I guess it would be helpful, and I want to ask you a kind of funny question to like explain Heidegger's project like I'm five years old in a way that uh, would be beneficial to our audience who is unfamiliar with Heidegger and his work. And, and maybe you could tell us about Heidegger, who he was in a, as a person, some of the key events in his life and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, there's a lot to talk about there. there um, is, yeah, there in the last 20 years or so, we have had increasing amounts of evidence as to what Heidegger personally believed politically. And mm. um, so it's not that easy to get him off the hook. But uh, of course, that doesn't make him any less interesting. Sure. Um, so but I guess we should start with the um, the more philosophical question for a five-year-old is pretty tough, but I, I do remember <laughs> when my son was five years old and we read um, uh, Snow White. And at the end of the Snow White story, you know, the prince kisses Snow White and her eyes opened. She was alive. Right. And he says, what does alive mean? Oh, wow. Which is a really chilling question right uh, uh oh now i have to explain death uh now i have to explain to a five-year-old it's possible for you not to exist right and that's hanging over you at every moment so of course you tread very lightly with a little kid but um 
for Heidegger, that question of death um, is very important. So that's maybe a good place to start. That tells us something about our own existence, what it means for humans to exist. And then not just um, for humans, because we are somehow able to have a sense of what it means for anything to exist or be. And he thinks there's a connection between these two things. So it's because we, because our own being is contingent and finite and shadowed by nothingness that, that we actually are sensitive to what it means for ourselves to be and for anything to be. Um, so to, to spell that out a little bit more, uh, we are temporal and mortality is part of that. Uh, and it's thanks to our own temporality that uh, we have an understanding of being according to Heidegger. Mm. So this is why his main book is called Being in Time. Right. You know, what it means to exist, I mean, I think a lot of us, uh, at least I know that I did, during this whole uh, pandemic, I went to a very existential place in my thoughts and research and, you know, in, in bringing up natural questions of like, what is important to me? Like, what, how do I make my way in the world? And how do I relate to others? And how do I relate to the world itself? Um, you know, Heidegger seemed to be a sort of natural place to gravitate to with these sorts of questions. Um, so when you say that Heidegger is, you know, death, what it means to exist, there was a lot of, uh, we released a couple episodes, I think four episodes on death, uh, mainly uh, out of the work of Todd May, actually. And he was gracious enough to, to visit the show, which was wonderful. And we talked about existentialism and, and, and the logical end of sort of human temporality, like uh, what it is to be an atheist and to reckon with uh, uh, the temporality of life and being the only creature on earth that uh, is aware of their impending death. You know, like uh, cats and animals may have somewhat complicated cognitive workings, but they don't understand that they will be gone one day and they don't stare at a grave and understand that there is a not just the the, the pervasiveness of death how it applies to everyone in society but how your own death is like an individualistic uh sort of thing that applies to you specifically um so heidegger kind of i i could see how you could uh say that heidegger kind of works off this pivot of of being towards death uh, of death itself being the thing that makes us reflect and perhaps generates a sort of emergency of being. Um, so maybe could, could you speak to um, Heidegger's sense of temporality, Heidegger's sense of being towards death and, and ultimately what his project of, of like defining being sort of uh, what that entails. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. So, so sure. yes, he uses this expression of being towards death, which doesn't mean, being morbid or suicidal or, you know, obsessed with when you're going to croak. It's more that whether you're facing it or, or avoiding it, the fact of your own possible death is there at every moment. You're always mortal. Um, and that makes a difference because it's sort of, uh, if you face up to it, it urges you to take a stand of some kind on who you are. Um, so the way he puts this is that your own being is an issue for you. Mm. And um, facing your mortality is one way of doing that. So um, mortality is one very important facet of futurity, right? We always mm -hmm. have a future until we don't. Um, and we're always projecting or we find ourselves projected into some possible way to be, you know, whether it's to be a podcaster or a professor or son or artist or whatever it is, we're somehow interpreting ourselves in terms of what we can do, who we can be. But there's always that possibility that we may not be able to be anyone. You know, we, we're we mortal. Uh, and so that's the futural aspect of temporality. And there is also a, a past aspect, which he calls thrownness. Mm. Um, or you could think of it as situatedness. You know, we don't come out of nowhere. We have a history and we're always again, consciously or unconsciously drawing on that history, um, our personal history, but also a shared uh, cultural communal history. Um, so without those elements of past and future, we wouldn't even have a present. Um, you can't 
you strictly speaking, you can't be here now, period. You know, because there is no here and there is no now aside from this projection and thrownness and historical embeddedness. Nothing would make any sense at all. Um, so this leads into the broader question of what it means to be in general, because uh, according to Heidegger, there's a traditional Western or maybe universally human prejudice to take being or existence as synonymous with presence. Mm. So to be is to be a present thing and not an absent thing. Um, and his guess is that that sense of being as presence really arises from within the temporal present. So, you know, you and I are here now, and so we can um, notice that various things are present, and yes, they are. But if that's all you think about, then you're missing this bigger question of, well, how is presence available to us? And and maybe some things are not simply present. You know, humans are not just present. We're also futural, and we're also past. It sounds like, uh, like Heidegger gained... Uh, some influence from Henri Bergson uh, in, in a way that like time to Bergson wasn't like a linear thing, I want to say. It was more like a a conjoining of the past and the future synergized into the present moment. And so there's a, a bit of like a, a head uh, change, like a change of like how we have to look at time instead of something that's linear to something that's more spatial uh, within Bergson's philosophy. Was there... Was there a link between like Heidegger and maybe some of like Time and Free Will by Bergson? Well, in some of Heidegger's early writings, he does refer to Bergson um, okay. critically, but in a way mm. that shows that he took him seriously. But so Bergson claims that the way we usually think about time is actually inappropriately spatialized, if I understand mm. him right. Mm. But right. when you okay. picture time as a timeline, or if you picture it as the fourth dimension of space time or something, mm -hmm. you've just translated temporal relations into spatial ones, which, you know, you can do conceptually, but you miss the duration, the actual experience right. of extension in time. Um, so Heidegger was very intrigued by that as, as a young man, but but he felt that it, it didn't really capture the, uh, you could say the drama of human existence, um, mm. that way we're, we're stretched into future and stretched into past, and and we experience ourselves as plunged into the present. Uh, in a way that calls for decision, perhaps. Right. Is that kind of what he means by, like, human beings are not a thing that stops at their skin? That's part of it, yeah. So temporality is, quote, ecstatic for Heidegger, meaning we stand out of just our our skin. Uh, we, stand out of, out of, out of, we stand out of our spatiotemporal point. Hmm. Um, and it also means that we are not um that we're always about something other than ourselves we always care about ourselves to be sure but that's part of caring about other things in our world so we're not stuck in our brain for instance mm -hmm. um so he never denies that you need a brain in order to think or that sort of thing but the brain somehow um relates to other things and it's about other things and uh it is involved with other things. And so there is transcendence to a world. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, it's funny you bring up transcendence and, and because I I guess I've been doing some research around um, spirituality, but, but spirituality as it applies towards like inchoate fascism uh, and, and some of the slippery slopes that can, you know, kind of take one person from say a thinking about uh maybe nature has a certain enchantment and then from there that can slide into feelings that human beings should be co-equals uh with nature and then maybe that takes on biocentrism and and all of a sudden you're an advocate for diminishing human exceptionalism and 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 so the the, the concept of transcendence i i wonder in because i did sense a little bit of like uh, metaphysical transcendence thing going on within Heidegger's writing, and uh, and maybe we're skipping a little ahead with like the questions of metaphysics. But I I feel like around uh, in Germany at this time there was like an air of the occult going on within certain members of the Nazi Party and stuff, and it's kind of hard for me to imagine Heidegger sitting around his flat just like coming up with concepts like time is the horizon for being, 
but like was there i mean it, it, at a certain point he kind of gets into like more expressly metaphysical stuff maybe even verging on on the occult and and so i wonder if you could speak to that aspect of heidegger yeah well of course it depends what you mean by metaphysics but let's not get sure. into semantics i know right, what, right, you're, right. what you're getting at and um so what i've talked about so far does it does largely come out of his study of concepts and texts he spent a lot of time studying aristotle um, and just being immersed in the tradition of Western metaphysics, just under just defined as the study of being, the study mm -hmm. of what it means to be, which mm -hmm. is not necessarily an obscurantist or irrational project at all. Right. Um, but there is an impatience there with um, everydayness, as he calls it. Mm. Um, this is this is what people like Heidegger and Schmidt and Nietzsche, I think, what makes them appeal to people. Who are pretty far left or pretty far right is that both those camps are impatient with bourgeois day-to-day -day mm. life and just you know the acceptance of the system as we know it um they all want to get deeper and heidegger certainly did um plus involved in this critique of um being as presence is a certain opposition to um positivism so the the view that um, natural science and its facts and results are and methods are the be all and end all of everything, um, you know, because maybe that's all based on a very narrow understanding of being. Mm. So if presence isn't all there is, and instead there's this deep embeddedness in history, then you can see how this might lend itself to a kind of mythology. And mm -hmm. he does say somewhere that um, the earliest, that any account of the beginnings of human history is mythology, if it's anything you have to resort to mythology. Um, and this idea of drawing on the shared past or heritage of your community could lend itself to that as well as to nationalism. Right. So um, I think he definitely has a, a crisis, a conceptual restlessness after being in time, which is 1927, uh, in the next couple of years. And then there's you know, the Great Depression and there's still greater political turmoil. The Nazis come to power. And yeah, I think he kind of goes off the deep end for a while, which I find uh, very interesting. I've written a lot about that. I don't think it's all garbage, but it's something you have to be very careful about. Um, right. So he does, he looks to poetry instead of somebody like Aristotle. He mm. looks to Holderlin, the romantic poet, as um, kind of prophet of German destiny. Uh, and his, his thought becomes increasingly, quote, mystical. Um, so, so you're onto something. Okay. Wow. So, uh, if I'm to understand Heidegger and, uh, kind of his path, he's expanding upon like phenomenology, but greatly sort of indebted and, and, and mentored by, um, Edwin Herserl. Um, and so I, I wonder if you could speak to the relationship that, uh, that Heidegger had with Herserl. Uh, and, and phenomenology in it more broadly and how uh, and, and how Heidegger's work uh, kind of, I guess, expands the, the study of phenomenology, because I, uh, I guess if I'm asking this correctly, I would say that um, could you define phenomenology, uh, Herschel and, and what he did with that and why Heidegger uh, was mentored by Herschel and expounded upon it? I'll, I'll try. So, so Husserl himself was never really happy with his own definition of what he was doing. So, so mm. how to define phenomenology is very contentious and complex. Um, mm. But the basic idea is, uh, before we get into the question of what there really is, or how things really are, let's just sort of bracket that. Mm. Let's not take a stance on that. And let's focus on how things appear. Let's just do a really good job of describing experience. Uh, and this description is not going to be simply factual, you know, hey, a bird flew across the sky, but it's going to try to find structures and, and um, essences, to use as a word that sometimes Husserl favors, within that experience. Okay, so what is, um, you know, instead of just looking up at a bird in the sky, I might think about, well, what is my experience of orientation in general and upness and downness? Um, do, let's describe that. So, so aspects of experience that are there that show themselves to us, but which we usually don't focus on because they're so fundamental. Hmm. Um, so the Heidegger um, 
was very inspired by Husserl when he read Husserl and then got to meet Husserl and, and become his assistant. Um, he thought the phenomenology was an exciting possibility, and he just took it in being in time as a very, very general thing, which is simply letting things show themselves as they show themselves, <laughs> you know, which hmm. is easier said than done, because often we don't let them show themselves. We rush to impose a category on them or um, fit them into preconceived biases. So just really letting things display themselves. Um, now, Husserl also had a Cartesian bent, uh, as okay. he himself said. So he's in this phenomenology. He wants certainty, and he wants to get at um, absolutely clear, essential structures of experience that are universal for all minds. And the side of Heidegger that emphasizes history and human finitude, it doesn't fit very well with that. Mm. Okay. There, Heidegger was more inspired by another um, earlier philosopher, Wilhelm Dilthey, uh, and Robert Scharf has a very good book on this that came out recently. Um, Dilthey was um, somebody else who resisted the domination of positivism and the methods of natural science and emphasized that the human sciences, humanities and, and um, you know, social thought um, are very different. They require attention to contingent embeddedness and cultural relativity of a certain kind and understanding rather than explaining. Hmm. Um, so in, and in this way, Heidegger is more sympathetic to Dill time than Husserl. So, so what Heidegger does to phenomenology is he says, yes, we're going to try to notice how things show themselves, but we're going to drop this insistence on having a final certain absolute answer. We're going to really do justice to human contingency and, um, and, um, and finitude. And I would say most phenomenologists since then have tended to sympathize with that. Um, then Husserl has provoked lots of phenomenologists who disagree with things that he kept repeating throughout his life. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, I mean, today is, uh, May 26th on the day we're recording this. And, uh, if I, I think Heidegger died today in the seventies. Uh, so like it's his death anniversary today, actually. I did not even realize that. Yeah. He, he died in 1976, but I had forgotten the day. I just, uh, yeah, I just, um, was on Twitter earlier and some of the philosophy people on there pointed that out and I was like, Oh wow. How I, it was unintentional, but that's very cool. Um, so as I'm to understand, uh, his train of thought, his philo philosophical line of thinking, it, it kind of took a, a political slant by shifting from asking something like what is being to who am I and who are we? And I'm wondering if you have a feel for how much of this shift was due to the circumstances of society in that point, like, you know, just being in Germany in the 1930s uh, versus like a pursuit of his own philosophical project. So I, I guess if I'm, I guess I'm asking if Heidegger's decision to join the Nazis, could that have just been, maybe pressure from society on him, or did he arrive at the realm of the political just through sort of following through on his own projects? Yeah, that's very well stated, and that's the huge question about Heidegger's mm. politics, because if the politics really had nothing essential to do with his philosophy, as some say, then it's not a big deal. I mean, sure, millions of people joined the Nazi party and believed in it, and but um, that's, you know, sociologically interesting, but doesn't affect their theoretical views. Right. Uh, for instance, um, Frege, a famous logician, very important figure in analytic philosophy, was a virulent anti-Semite, as we know from his diaries, but mm. it has nothing to do with his logic. It's pretty easy to make that case. Right. Um, with Heidegger, it's not so easy. And of course, the other extreme point of view is, oh yeah, it's all there in being in time. I mean, 1927, the Nazis were already around. Um, he knows about these movements. You can tell that he's anti-bourgeois, as I said, mm -hmm. um, he's, and he's uh, looking to the radical right, and it's all proto-fascist. So I, I come down somewhere in between. Um, I think most people are somewhere on the spectrum between, but there's a lot of room for different positions. I think um, the, the views in Being in Time do leave the door open to fascism in a certain way, because 
so first of all, there's this critique, as I said, of bourgeois everydayness and what he calls the they. In other words, um, you know, you do what they do, you, you think what they think, you say what they say, and you're just a sort of nobody in everyday life. So there's an impatience then with kind of the norm of society, uh, mm -hmm. even though we can't help having that norm as part of who we are, um, it tends to draw us down into inauthenticity. And so that would suggest that uh, democracy, as it's understood in, in liberalism, is superficial because, you know, a majority vote means nothing and individual rights mean nothing because these individuals are inauthentic. So you need something deeper. Hmm. Um, and as far as the Marxist alternative, he never shows any sympathy to it. I think he sees it as too ahistorical and uh, reductive. Um, and he doesn't have much of the sense of justice that, you know, explicitly or implicitly motivates a lot of leftists, I think. So he's looking more for national belonging. And so I think there is a kind of nationalism that's that's not far beneath the surface in being time. He says that if you're going to find some sort of possible way of being somebody, you have to draw on your thrownness and you're part of a community. You have a heritage. And so you have to, if you're a German, you have to find some way of being authentically German. Now, that's not Nazism yet, and it's not fascism. Um, but I think it opens the door to it, especially when you consider that there's no um, ethics really in being time. You know, he calls for you to be authentic, but he doesn't, he very strictly avoids saying you should, you should or you shouldn't treat other people in, in the following ways. Right. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I hadn't thought of authenticity in the way that you just mentioned. And I'm getting a little bit of like a, uh, like a Thomas Jefferson vibe out of that. And, and what I mean mm -hmm. by that is like, authenticity in in heidegger's sense i've always thought of it as like a a way of like sort of recovering oneself from being lost in the everydayness and so it's kind of a shift in thought that allows you to reclaim oneself out of that lostness and bring yourself into temporality in a, in a way that's like present and so you, you hear the word authenticity kind of thrown around and used, uh, however naive of the Heideggerian underpinnings of that term by people who are like spiritual, but not religious and that they, they're, they're kind of, I don't know, their, their self-actualization process includes becoming more of themselves. And so this authenticity, I, I, I've known it within that context, but if I'm hearing you correctly, you're talking about Heidegger using authenticity as a way of like critiquing liberalism in that, like, what does it matter if these people vote for a policy because they're all inauthentic? So it's like a way of in, invalidation in a way that, and I say Thomas Jefferson in a way that like, yeah, he said all citizens are created equal or all men are created equal, but his definition of who was capable of being a citizen was something that is kind of below the surface or that's used as a sort of invalidation. So, so is that is that right that he was kind of using authenticity in some regards as like uh, in, as a method for invalidating or, or a critique of uh, the status quo? Well, in being in time, he never uses the word democracy or, or liberalism. But when he develops more political writings, he talks extensively against liberalism as a sort of metaphysical system or way mm. of thinking that's manifested in liberal politics. And wow. he's very scornful of it. Um, and sort of typical critiques of liberalism, that it's atomistic, it's has a superficial concept of what a human being is, superficial concept of community. Um, and you, you can make those critiques from left or right. Um, and now there is a, an element of uh, Heidegger's authenticity, which is very individualistic. Right. So you have to, according to being time, as we said, face your mortality and also face experiences such as uh, anxiety, angst, where things just seem to have no meaning anymore. Um, everything seems just empty and and thin, and there's it's just hanging over an abyss. Right. So that is what wakes you up to um, the call to be authentic. But if you're actually going to put that into practice, you have to somehow re-enter the world, which is a shared world, and you have to find some kind of cultural resource for what are you going to do? Who are you going to be? Right. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's fascinating. Um, I mean, this entire conversation to me is, is really interesting just to, to parse out about Heidegger. I, I wonder, uh, was he a religious person? Uh, well, he was raised uh, in a Catholic part of Germany, a Catholic household. His father was the sexton of the local church. Um, and uh, he actually had the intention to become a Jesuit priest when he was a young man, mm. uh, joined a Jesuit seminary, but left after two weeks because it, it didn't fit. Um, supposedly he had heart problems. As you say, he lived on to 1976, so I don't think they were very serious. Right. But more, you know, questions of the heart in the metaphorical sense. Sure. Um, and then he he had doubts about Catholic dogma. He married a woman who was Protestant. Um, and then they both kind of gave up their faiths. And in being in time, he's just strictly neutral on all religious questions. So, for instance, uh, death, being towards death is huge. But he says, and this, and I'm not taking any position on whether there's an afterlife. Sure. Which seems... Oh. Uh, paradoxical on the face of it, but what he means is, you know, regardless of the question of when you may or may not uh, cease to be, the possibility of ceasing to be is always hanging over you. And that's true whether you're a Christian or not. And um, So he systematically kind of relegates all those religious issues to um, things we're bracketing as phenomenologists. Right. But then uh, in the 30s, when he gets into this more... Um, sort of a cult and mystical phase, he starts uh, talking quite a bit about the gods, uh, mm. influenced uh, in part by Holderlin, who was kind of obsessed with the ancient Greek gods and um, their absence in the modern world. So Heidegger starts to ask, you know, who, why have the gods flown and could the gods return? Could there be a god? Um, a final God, whatever he means by that. Um, and later on, he talks about the dimension of the holy as part of uh, full-fledged human existence. So mm -hmm. it never he never becomes um, a member of an organized religion again, but uh, a lot of religious people do take some inspiration from Heidegger. I'm curious to, to I don't know if you have a feel for this, but I, Something called uh, capital T traditionalism has sort of come into my uh, uh, my attention lately, and I've done a bunch of research on it. And I I wonder if you would know if Heidegger had any engagement with such writers as either Rene Guénon or uh, Julius Evola. I'm not aware of those connections. No. Okay, yeah, just a um, quick question, sure. And now that we're talking about kind of um, rightist ideologies and, and ideas, uh, another big question is the question of racism. So, you know, we think of the Nazis as racists, and they certainly sure. were, but, but what did that mean? So especially in the early days of the revolution, it was kind of uh, open to question, and there was a lot of ferment uh, in Nazi circles about you know, what does it mean to talk about the racial purity or to be anti-Jewish? Or um, And Heidegger always um, had at least strong reservations and, and often, uh, especially later, was very strongly against biological racism, mm. uh, which is kind of what we stereotypically associate with what the Nazis became, the whole theory of genetic superiority and the master race and right. you know, a certain quantum of blood and so on. He thought that that was all really superficial and, and ahistorical. Mm. However, that doesn't mean he's not racist in any sense. Um, and uh, the black notebooks that I think we, we may talk about later, so his right. personal journals um, do include anti-Jewish remarks. And um, he was very concerned with saving the Germans and thereby saving the West and thereby saving the planet. And the role of the Jews in this is well, they don't have a role, you know, they're, wow, yeah. they're exponents of a God who's dead. Right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I only asked about the, the Julius Evola or Rene Guénon stuff, because, uh, like I said, it's hard for me to imagine, um, Heidegger sitting around his flat, uh, drafting things like, uh, time is a horizon of being and not have some more, uh, expressly sort of metaphysical things going on. And, uh, 
you know, Evola was a guy who was um, kind of kind of pushing for this. Uh, I mean, in his writing, it's very metaphysical, you know, and Rene Guénon is like the guy that said, like, the malaise of the modern world is uh, within its relentless denial of the metaphysical. So the more that uh, the critiques of liberalism uh, come up for Heidegger, the more I find they share kind of common sentiments with some of the uh, critiques of liberalism that come out of the traditionalist school. So that's, and, and that's kind of how I wanted to, to discover if there was any connection between those two things. And if there's not, that's fine too. I just, um, but it seems like all this stuff is sort of happening around the same time. And so yeah. part of my, yeah. So part of my engagement with like reading being in time and situating it within history, uh, is understanding that while all these other things going on, uh, the degree to cross pollination happened, uh, is something that I'm curious about. Um, but maybe you could, uh, on the flip side of this, we could talk about the importance of Heidegger as a philosopher to uh, existentialism. And, and um, let's see, uh, like, I know that, I mean, he wrote Being and Time, and then Sartre wrote Being and Nothingness. And, and maybe you could talk about the relationship between those two works, if that's possible. Okay. Um, yeah, first let me mention that, you know, these writers you you were listing, such as Ganon, I don't know if there's any actual influence, but there are affinities, you know, and there's a spirit sure. of a time. And so I don't think that you're wrong to suspect a link there. And okay. actually a contemporary example right now is uh, Alexander Dugin. Yes. Who's a yeah. Russian political theorist who is very enthusiastic about Heidegger and Heidegger's most nationalist and obscure tendencies. And he's uh, extremely anti-liberal, claims right. he's not a fascist, but um, on, yeah, I would take that with a grain of salt. Right. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about duty and too, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I've, I've gone to some very dark places in some of these Google searches. Uh, but I, I, Alexander Dugan is maybe one of the darkest characters I've encountered in the way that he is, uh, synergizing a, a sort of like political syncretist of ideas of the left and the right, combining them. And, uh, but part of his, uh, Part of his shtick is being a traditionalist, uh, believing in transcendence, um, and sort of trying to infuse the spirit of fascism with uh, with spirituality and transcendence in general. Um, so I, part of what is so unsettling to me about Alexander Dugin is that I think he is, uh, he's a really smart guy that is very enthusiastic about Heidegger. And when he quotes Heidegger or someone like Jill Deleuze or someone, I'm like, it kind of freaks me out that he's familiar with all these people who I read and engage with. And uh, um, But the other side of that is um, I think he's quite astute to pick up on the fact that sort of secular liberalism, secular society has, has left us with this sort of like wanting sort of gape or this gap for like, uh, like the for spirituality or something more like the meaninglessness of life, consumer culture, that which we, that which makes us human cannot be communed with via consumerism, right? Like the meaninglessness of that, he is quite astute to pick up on that and understand that there is a large sort of wanting need in society, and I believe that he is intending to leverage that. Uh, to provide a form of fascism with something that could fill that gap. Um, so I, yeah, Alexander Dugin in his fourth political theory calling, I think he's referring to like that fourth theory, although he doesn't really name it. He does refer to it as Dasein, which is a Heideggerian term. Um, so yeah, all sorts of stuff we could talk about with, uh, with Mr. Dugin there. Um, yeah. And, you know, I have to confess that I'm basically a liberal <laughs> in sure, other words. Yeah. For me, I uh, I appreciate personal liberties, and I think that that doesn't necessarily translate into superficial consumerism. I think it just leaves us free to pursue the good life, however we may, we may conceive it, and it may be something very politically and spiritually deep. But clearly, there are many people for whom that's not enough, and they want something collective. Um, they want something you know, deeply moving. Um, you know, Trumpism is one example of that in, in many ways, and uh, there can be many other flavors of it. So, so Dugan, Dugan is, um, he's along those same lines, but of course tying into this deep Russian tradition of authoritarianism and anti-Westernism, anti-rationalism. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of um, a lot of Dugan's talks of transcendence, a lot of Dugan's talk about the fourth political theory, a lot of that, at its core, it's probably like just Russian imperialism. You know, like like it's basically like, I mean, the guy, I don't think he had any public notoriety until he wrote Foundations of Geopolitics, and that's been referred to as like Russia's manifest destiny. And uh, so now that his beliefs have sort of linked at the point where they share in common aspects of conservative politics, now he's been thrust into the spotlight. Um, but I don't think his fringe sort of uh, ideology or belief system of traditionalism would have ascended to that point uh, without uh, his dealing with uh, conservative politics in Russia. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of forgot where we were at this point after talking about Dugan. We were, I was supposed to talk about Sartre, and I can do that oh, if you like. Oh, right, right, yeah, um, the, 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 the sort of um, where being and nothingness of Sartre and uh, being in time of Heidegger sort of how they work uh, in tandem or how Sartre kind of, I, cause I, you know, the other question I wanted to ask you, and, and I don't want to like build this question up too far. So as soon as I, as soon as we talk about Sartre and Heidegger and their stuff they have going on, I, I'd like to speak about being in time and some of the obstacles that being in time has going on to comprehend it, whether it's the, the translation, the translation thing, or whether it's uh that Heidegger wrote uh, the beginning of being in time after he already knew things that he only got to at the end of his book. And so it, it, there's many different things going on, I think, that um, that can make that a difficult text to absorb. Um, but maybe we can start with like how being in time and being in nothingness, Sartre and Heidegger respectively, how they kind of, how, how one led to another, maybe? Um, I'll try to give you a quick take on that. It's been a while <laughs> since I studied Sartre, but um, so Sartre picks up on uh, phenomenology also, um, and certainly had read Heidegger pretty carefully when he worked on his his material. Um, he takes Heidegger and um, a lot of language from Hegel as well, and develops this um, this book being in nothingness. And even those words are they're Heideggerian words. Right. Um, Heidegger reportedly. You know, the, these mid 20th century books, you had to slit open the pages of the book. And uh, he slid open, you know, the first 20 pages of being nothingness and then just cast it aside. <laughs> he was not very patient for <laughs> with many other philosophers. But um, what they have in common, I would think, is that um, for both of them, the possibilities that you project ahead of yourself are crucial to interpreting yourself and your surroundings. Um, so there's that element of futurity, uh, and they're both asking what it means to be. Um, but, but Sartre is much more voluntaristic. So for him, uh, if I interpret him correctly, that this projection of possibilities is a choice, essentially. It's, um, a choice that you may not realize that you've made, but which somehow is a choice nonetheless. Uh, and everything flows from that choice that, de that determines the value of everything you encounter. Um, for Heidegger, there's what he calls projection into the future, but projection is not voluntary. Projection happens. You know, you mm -hmm. find yourself kind of thrust forward into these possibilities, and then you may or may not make um, resolute choices on that basis. Uh, and Heidegger also emphasizes thrownness or the past or your indebtedness to your culture and history more than Sartre does. Um, there's also a, a kind of Cartesianism in Sartre, a kind of Cartesian dualism where nothingness refers to you and me because we're not a thing mm. and everything around us is just a thing that's inert that's just merely in itself instead of being for itself or self-conscious and free which is all hegelian language and um, so heidegger would find that all way too traditional and not he would think that it doesn't take the question of what it means to be seriously enough hmm. so uh, yeah yeah right <laughs> Yeah, I know these questions are, are kind of, um, it's quite a bit, so I, you're, it's it's wonderful everything you're saying, and I, I'm kind of astounded that you're able to respond and sort of describe these things. I know they're very heady questions, so. Uh, well, uh, I've been at this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so tell me about um, being in time and why it's such a, a difficult text to penetrate, you know, like, um, yeah. I, 
it, it, to tell you the truth, it like it it really was helpful to me listening to you speak about some of the stuff because it it made me feel like, oh, there's a reason why I'm trying to read the first 20, 30 pages and I'm not really getting much out of this text. And maybe if I just crack the book open in the middle and choose a random place, it's a it's kind of a better way of going about it in a way, because it at least it was more uh, attainable at that point. Um, so, yeah. So tell me about um, being in time and and. and was the project of uh, of Heidegger complete at the end of that book, or um, and and how would you suggest the layman going about attempting to read that? Well, in a word, no, it was not complete. Um, <laughs> that's one of the problems. It's an incomplete project. Hmm. Um, and I do, by the way, have a book that's more um, for beginners. It's called Heidegger: An Introduction. It's a hmm. little bit out of date. It was published in 1999, so I would like to update it with references to primary and secondary literature that's come out since then. Um, but uh, yeah, that's one of the problems. So it's called Being in Time. And on page one, he says, OK, my working hypothesis is that time is the horizon for being. In other words, whenever we understand what it means to be in any form, it's our temporality that makes that possible. And then the last line of the entire book after 400 some pages is, does time itself manifest itself as the horizon for being? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, um, so he really didn't get around to to proving his main thesis, and he was planning to. So that's just that's just um, uh, the first part of being in time is what's published, and he was planning to follow up, but he felt that he that he'd somehow gotten into a blind alley, and and exactly why that is is another contentious question. Mm -hmm. um, there's an anthology that came out on that recently to which I contributed a chapter edited by Lee Braver. Um, cool. So that's one problem. He doesn't get where he means to go. And since he doesn't get there, everything he says is kind of unclear by his own lights, because if you don't know what it means to be, which is really what he was trying to get at, um, then how can you talk about this or that being of this or that thing that exists and he's that's what he's doing throughout the whole book is he's talking about humans or or dasein um as the entity who has an understanding of being but what does any of that mean so it's it's not the kind of book that starts off with really clear definitions that you then uh just follow throughout which is more like a mathematical proof which is the ideal for some philosophers it's more we're going to start off with some rough and ready um, sketches, and then we're going to deepen those and, and develop more vocabulary around that, and we're working towards greater and greater clarity, and then we stop. So, um, <laughs> so that can be frustrating. Yeah, um, I, I find that there is some, uh, I guess, things like uh, being on hand or being at hand, like some of the ways some of these words in German translate uh, seem to leave open the possibility that Heidegger, Heidegger had with his statements, with these translations, and, and you know, it, it like, like maybe he's talking about two completely different things because being at hand or being on hand would skew whatever interpretation, depending on which one we choose it is. Um, could you talk about maybe some of the translation uh, issues or difficulties that go on throughout his text? Sure, um, and there there are two main translations of being in time into English, the one that came out in 1962 by Macquarie and Robinson, mm -hmm. and then Joan Stambaugh did a translation that came out in the 90s, uh, I believe, and was revised by Dennis Schmidt, mm. um, and it's a little more, uh, it's a little less daunting because there are fewer polysyllabic words, mm. and it seems a little more accessible, but of course it's still Heidegger. And people right. have also made some criticisms of it. So the, nothing is perfect. Um, I do think Macquarie and Robinson are pretty good on most things. Right. Um, so in their translation, the two words you referred to are uh, present at hand and ready to hand. There you go, yeah. So yeah. in German, it's um, vorhanden and zuhanden. So they both have that root of hand. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you can experience entities, beings, things that are, as you know, lying there at hand in front of you, present, or um, instead of just staring at them as objects, you can grab them and use them, and then they're ready to hand. Mm. So this is part of his critique of 
the uh, tradition of philosophy is that we have tended to assume that to be is to be present at hand, to be an object that you just kind of stare at and you you relate to intellectually or cognitively. And so um, in several passages, he talks about hammering as an example. You grab the hammer as a ready to hand thing. You don't have to have any theoretical beliefs about it or opinions. You just use it. And that's when it discloses itself as a phenomenon. It's when it's it's when you're using it to hammer nails into wood. Um, and it all fits into part of your workshop that you're familiar with and comfortable with. And it's only if that breaks down and, you know, the hammer breaks or something that you then have to look at, whoa, what's going on with this object? And then you might begin to experience it as a present at hand thing. Hmm. But he claims you can't then go back and say, well, everything that I experienced earlier can all be put in terms of facts about present at hand entities. That would, that would really miss the texture of life um and this by the way may be some it may be one point where people who are more on the left can find resonance in heidegger because it can be a description of the experience of labor and production um that can mm. be stimulating. so so marcuse was a student of heidegger's and initially you know before heidegger became a nazi thought oh this is a great way to refresh marxism mm -hmm. yeah um I wonder, like, because I think uh, I think it was Derrida who flatly refused um, sort of like uh, the question of like, can philosophy do without Heidegger's contributions? And uh, so Derrida sort of flat out refused that. Um, so one, I'm wondering, like, how much of Heidegger's philosophy is tainted by his joining the Nazi party? A a and two what would philosophy like if we could take heidegger and sort of just snuff out all of his stuff like what would philosophy as a whole be missing at that point yeah i mean i think we'd be missing an awful lot i think he's almost everything in heidegger is is worth thinking about mm -hmm. um my friend gregory freed and i edited an anthology on this topic called after heidegger question mark oh, wow. uh, which consists of like 30 very short essays by scholars on um, you know, what do you think is left from Heidegger or, or what's most alive and most provocative in Heidegger? What's mm -hmm. still worth thinking about? You know, maybe there are some things that just didn't work out. They're still mm -hmm. worth thinking about insofar as you you learn why they didn't work out. But but what, what is really alive? And so there are a lot of different answers to that. Um, now, historically, what we would have missed is developments in phenomenology and existentialism that we've talked about. Um, another main movement is hermeneutics. Oh. Um, the main exponent of that in philosophy is a student of Heidegger, um, Hans-Georg Gadamer, um, in his book Truth and Method. And hermeneutics just means the, the, the practice of interpretation. Traditionally, it means interpreting the Bible. But um, as a philosophy, it, it's the idea that everything is an interpretation, basically. And um, there is no final answer, but it's not total relativism. There are... There are um, grounded and deep and thoughtful interpretations, and, and there are less thoughtful interpretations. Um, mm -hmm. And there's an interesting dialogue between Gadamer and Derrida, by the way. And Derrida himself certainly is, is very indebted to Heidegger, so deconstruction or more broadly postmodernism um, draws on this idea from Heidegger that there is, you can't just reduce everything to some present at hand reality that you cognitively grasp and are certain about. Um, that's not the way meaning works. It's not the way being works. Hmm. Are there any connections between Heidegger and like strains of new age spiritual thought? I mean, as with an increasing number of people breaking with religious traditions of their youth and more and more people identifying as like spiritual, but not religious. I, so I think at least in terms of the vernacular, we've talked about like the term authenticity that's kind of been picked up there. Um, so I, so I wonder uh, you know, if, if Heidegger has some effect on how we describe our everydayness now, or what he has in terms of influence over like New Age thought. I'm not sure. I think he has maybe no direct influence on New Age thought, but maybe second or third hand. And mm. and again, as we were saying, there there are affinities and there's a spirit of the times and Heidegger isn't unique. And so there are 
many voices calling for authenticity and calling for some sort of deeper um, connections within a modernity that's experienced as uh, empty and routine and, and um, devoid of meaning. Okay. So um, let's talk about the black notebooks, man. I know that um, these are, these are only things that have come to my attention recently. And so I, so I wonder, because I, I feel like you've probably worked like close with the, uh, with the black books and stuff like that. Um, can you tell me what their contents are, if we should take any of their contents seriously, if there's anything in the black notebooks that would be, uh, that would function as maybe like an addendum to uh, Heidegger's work? Um, like, how seriously should we take these black notebooks? They're just thought journals, you know? Sure. Yeah, I think it would be a mistake to take them as, you know, the real answer to everything that Heidegger is about. But what they are is just a series of journals that are bound in black. So they're literally black notebooks. Um, and the ones we have date from, I think it's 1931 until maybe 40 years later, the early 70s. And, and they do show Heidegger at his most personal in a way. Um, I say in a way because uh, he uses the first person singular much more than he does in his usual texts, the ones mm -hmm. that were meant for publication. And he's um, expressing a lot of emotions and a lot of judgments about current events and he was in a bad mood a lot of the time <laughs> um it's very, they're they're kind of monotonously sour um and gloomy uh, of course a lot of them are from the 1930s and 1940s and they were glooming times uh -huh. um, but um yeah they're they're very dark and so they're black notebooks in that sense too Mm -hmm. um, as far as developing really original philosophical concepts there isn't much there i think I mean, there are sketches of new ideas that, that don't go very far. Uh, and by the way, there's a lot of private stuff by Heidegger mm -hmm. in addition to the Black Notebooks, which was published only after his death or, or still hasn't been published. And a lot of it is just this sort of obsessive graphomania where he's just, it's, it's admirable in a way. He just keeps hacking away at a few words and playing around with them, turning them over every which way, trying to eke all the meaning he can out of them. But it's very hard to read through. I mean, they're just they're notes that are uh, breeding grounds for ideas. Mm. Um, so as far as what he has to say about current events in the black notebooks, um, that is pretty revealing. So uh, you can see that uh, he's he's quite excited about Hitler in 1933. Mm. Um, and there is a letter to his brother Fritz where he says that, um, you know, he's it's from, I forget the year, but I think he says that since 1930, he's been reading Mein Kampf and has been quite enthusiastic about it. So wow. this, this did not come out of nowhere. Um, and in 33, he's very excited about the revolution. He shows some hesitation about doing what he did, which I don't think we've talked about, that he um, uh, became rector of the University of Freiburg and, and joined the Nazi party at the same time. So he was the first... Um, Nazi rector of the university, and, and he was responsible for implementing significant Nazi um, anti-Semitic policies. So oh, he wow. distributed this um, government questionnaire about everybody's uh, background, and if you were Jewish or half-Jewish, you were dismissed. And he wow. did make an argument for a couple of professors, a couple of Jewish professors, keep them on, but he, I don't think he objected in principle to purging the university. That's really interesting, man. As I, you know, in, in researching like Heidegger and Schmidt, uh, Schmidt seemed to be the more irredeemable character when you compare them because Schmidt was like a Nazi jurist that kind of helped build some of the infrastructure of national socialism. So what I'm picking up here is that like Heidegger, to the degree that I thought that, you know, maybe we didn't have uh, overt statements from him that really gave us insight into racism or twisted worldviews or things like that, uh, it seems like some of his deeds would uh, would support uh, the feeling that he felt this way. Yeah, and we do actually have a lot of evidence at this point. I, I agree okay. that Schmidt is, is less redeemable, in my opinion, although still a right. very interesting thinker. Um, Heidegger's main enthusiasm was 1933 to 34, so it was, it was the first year of the regime, he lasted for one year as rector and then had problems with 
everybody from uh, students who were actually more radical than he was mm -hmm. uh, to uh, bureaucrats in Berlin and faculty who didn't like his infringement on their academic freedom. And I um, mean, basically nobody liked Heidegger because <laughs> um, he was a Nazi, but he was a kind of weird Nazi. He tried to be original. He didn't put things very biologically, but he used the language of being and other things that people had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> um, so I, I think he was hoping to play an important role in this, helping to decide what the revolution would mean mm -hmm. and in um, getting it to somehow provoke Germany to look very deeply within itself and really struggle with that question, who are we? Um, and I don't think that's what most Nazis really wanted. They had already decided who they were and who right. wasn't they. <laughs> Um, so, so he was frustrated, but it's been argued that he had as just as much ambition as Schmidt did to really play an important part in the regime. And, wow. um, but he didn't, he stepped down in 34 and soon after that, you see him becoming quite bitter and, and disillusioned about at least mainstream Nazi ideology and, and, um, the bureaucratic side of the regime. Uh, and so you can trace this in the black notebooks. Um, now, some people still claim, well, the black notebooks just seal the deal. He was a horrible Nazi. I don't think so, but it's complicated. So in my interpretation, he does develop an increasingly strong and deep critique of Nazi ideology. Um, he sees it as a sort of late modern form of the metaphysics of presence and this attempt to dominate and control everything, mm. which sounds like it's on the right track. Right, and yet right. there's a very interesting passage from about 1938 when he says, and despite all this, it must be affirmed. Why? Wow. Um, I think the, the answer is that it's precisely because it's this extreme late modern nihilism that it has to be supported to the bitter end because this is how modernity is finally going to come crashing down and it's going to open the door to something radically new, hmm. whatever that may be. Did you, uh, in your readings or translations of the Black Notebooks, did you find Heidegger, did he ever start to use some of the language of being, the language of like being in time as it pertained, like in regards to maybe what was called the Jewish question? Like, because I wonder about that. If like, cause if, if there was, it's one thing to, you know, maybe maybe some of this we can chalk up to him just being in fucking Germany in the 30s. I mean, these people, uh, it, there, there are things that happened then that maybe would not have happened otherwise. Or people that would have came to adopt certain views that they would not have if they were not in and around at that time in history at that place. Um, so I wonder if any of the Heideggerian sort of language of being or some of the funny ways of speaking that we read uh, of Heidegger in uh in, in being in time and his other works, I wonder if he ever chose to use some of the language of his philosophical projects as it uh, pertains to uh, the, what was called the Jewish question. Unfortunately, yes. And uh, for Heidegger's greatest enemies, and the best known right now is a French scholar named Emmanuel Fay, F-A-Y-E. Um, this just proves that his entire philosophy is just disguised Nazism and anti-Semitism. Mm. Um, I think that's too simplistic, but these passages do exist. I've translated a, um, all of them that I could find, and I, my translations, including the context, fit into 11 pages. Um, so that's a significant amount, but considering that all the black notebooks are thousands and thousands of pages, um, it's not a major theme. But I'll just, I'll just quote a few of these sure. disturbing Thank you. passages. Um, this is from the late 30s. So interestingly, at, at the time when he's serving as rector, he says nothing about Jews in his mm. black notebooks. But wow. in the late 30s, when he's quite negative about the Nazis, he also gets explicitly negative about uh, Jews. So he says, maybe in this struggle, the greater groundlessness will triumph, which is bound to nothing and makes everything ser serviceable to itself, parentheses, Jewry. Oh, wow. Um, one of the most secret forms of the gigantic, and perhaps the oldest, is the tenacious skillfulness in calculating, hustling, and intermingling through which the worldlessness of Jewry is grounded. 
So those are just sort of stock stereotypes of, about the Jews, right. uh, which he's trying to integrate into his interpretation of the modern world. Um, the, so there's, there are quite a few of these remarks. Um, the most disturbing one is one that I'm looking for, and this is from the 1940s, and so the Holocaust is going on. He says, when what is, quote, Jewish in the metaphysical sense combats what is Jewish, no quotes, the high point of self-annihilation in history has been attained, supposing that the, quote, Jewish has everywhere completely seized mastery, so that even the fight against, quote, the Jewish, and it above all, becomes subject to it. So to, to disentangle that a little bit, he's saying that the Nazi persecution of the Jews is itself, quote, Jewish in some metaphysical sense. Um, so he's associating uh, Judaism with, or the, the spirit of, of Jewry, with this manipulative, objectifying, rootless, ahistorical, et cetera, et cetera, attitude, which he sees embodied in Nazi totalitarianism. So kind of a complex thought, um, but certainly not one that's friendly to Jews. You know, it's right, just right. sort of way of blaming the victim. Right. Are you aware of any of uh, Heidegger? Did he ever engage with a, with like a pamphlet that was available at the time called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a notorious forgery, which has been used right. by anti-Semites for over a century, right. still today. And um, uh, it was suggested um, uh, that, that maybe he had read it. Um, okay. I'm trying to think of the book that suggested that. Um, but uh, there's no evidence that he actually did. Okay. Um, we do know that he read Hitler, and Hitler certainly right. read that book. And you know, these were just slanders and stereotypes that were very popular and still are very popular. Right, right. And you know, I, I just part of my interest in all of this is just ascertaining, like, what was going on at the time, and, and what, uh, where Heidegger was sort of receiving this input from was it from the nazi party was it from propaganda was it from like uh conspiratorial sort of pamphlet passing or or things like that you know um so all of this is is really fascinating and i think throughout this conversation like i you know i i, I read heidegger and you come away from like being in time kind of questioning like at least for me like there's a there's a really beautiful thing that heidegger made me realize and that like when you're a child the world sort of happens like separate and apart from you it's like something that happens in addition to whatever you're doing but as you get older you realize you are not only a part of this world but you are embedded within it and so defining oneself you, you it's not possible to do that without uh understanding that you are a part embedded within the world itself, you know? Um, so there are some really beautiful sentiments that I've, that I've gained out of Heidegger, but there's also these really ugly sides, you know? And, and so, um, so part of my effort is just trying to figure out like how entangled, uh, Heidegger is with this stuff. Uh, if his philosophy is, is more tainted than we should, um, but also, like, is is Heidegger in some senses like too dangerous to read? You know, like, is he? I think there's some. Anyway, maybe you could uh, sort of speak to the question of whether he's too uh, dangerous to read. You know, all philosophy is too dangerous to read for some people. I mean, sure. Socrates was accused of corrupting the youth, and and not without reason, because right. if you say uh, instead of just sort of doing what everybody agrees is the just thing and encouraging other people to do the just thing, if you stop and say wait, what is justice? Oh, right. it's not what you say it is. That can't be right. So what is justice? That's very disturbing. And um, and then, especially if you're Socrates and you say, oh, I don't know what it is. I'm just asking you. <laughs> so, so, so you're just pulling the rug out from under people. And Heidegger is kind of Socratic. I mean, he, his you know, being in time ends with a question and his 
lecture courses are always really fascinating, but they just always raise many more questions than they answer. And uh, a lot of people find it very disturbing. Um, so I think he's worth reading for people who are thoughtful and also have some sort of sense of groundedness and are not just going to fall into hero worship of somebody just because he's intelligent. You know, it's very easy to get enthusiastic about whoever your philosopher is and then to kind of instinctively say he or she can do no wrong, but they're all flawed and they're all finite. Now, of course, Heidegger is especially disturbing because of his political affinities and he never truly felt remorse, I think, uh, at least not honestly and openly about having supported the Nazis. He never really came to terms with the Holocaust. Um, he never, I think, really articulated an ethical or political standpoint that works mm -hmm. or, or, you know, offers any guidance. But he's very deep and interesting and I think right about some other things. Huh. Yeah, I mean, even when... um. You know, for a while, I had a real fixation on Jill Deleuze, and and I was the positivism of Deleuze was something that really intrigued me, and I felt inspired by. And so, the, the metaphysics of Deleuze was something that like uh, helped beautify my own vantage point on life, and that there are flows and connections and rhizomes, and it's a really beautiful thing. And then you read Deleuze for a while, and you're like, hey, wait a second, why are all these fucking accelerationists uh, uh, really into Deleuze? And then you realize that his philosophy was sort of, you know, other people read him too and interpret it how they may, and and some people don't have the most uh, honorable of intentions with the, philosoph with the philosophy they take in. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I found that maybe there was a... Uh, Whereas, like, with Deleuze, I didn't recognize that immediately. I was just like, oh, wow, you know, uh, anti-Oedipus is wonderful. Um, but, like, with Heidegger, there certainly is this sort of air of, like, him being a, a more dangerous philosopher than most when you come to his, uh, come to his work. Um, and then combined with, like, you know, sort of the metaphysics of, of, of Heidegger and in, in the emergency that of being, you know, the... The urgency, the impatience, as you said, uh, create a sort of, um, there's just like an urgency that's salient throughout his text. Like you feel like, like, like you have to read this stuff because the questions he's posing are of such importance. And, 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 and funny enough, like 10 minutes before you heard of Heidegger, you weren't really asking yourself what it is to be, you know? So yeah. I mean, he's very rhetorically gifted and he's very intelligent, um, you know, but he's he's from the start, he was criticized as being too irrationalist and sort of empty in this urgency, like, you know, what are we supposed to do and, and what shouldn't we do? Um, and uh, too illogical and sort of arbitrary and dogmatic. And, and there's truth to all of those things. And yet what he says is very stimulating. Yeah, um, I, I have been fascinated by this idea of the emergency, that sort of key disruptive moment that transforms everything whether it's anxiety or whether it's some sort of collective uh, turmoil. Um, but I've come to feel that there is a real risk in focusing too much on those moments because they, they become utterly singular and uncategorizable, and that prevents you from drawing analogies to other times, other experiences, and thinking in a more rational way without being narrowly rationalistic about what's going on. So there's a tendency to lose your head in these experiences of a dramatic urgency. It sounds like you're familiar with uh, Giorgio Agamben uh, and like the states of exception that Agamben speaks uh, of. Oh, only indirectly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the emergency of being in Heidegger, um, you know, I think it's it's relatable to um, the sort of Schmidtian state of exception. And then uh, Agamben from there, um, he very eloquently kind of just screams, what about 9-11? Because he just talks about like the event and the state of exception that results of that and how um, the reoccurrence of states of exceptions are the things that eat away at democracy itself or democracy being democratic. Um, so he, Agamben sort of uh, talks about um, something akin to like a permanent Reichstag, uh, like a permanent state of exception 
Um, mm. But I think there is some optimism to be found within the writings of Agamben because he, um, within that moment of exception, it provides us the opportunity to disassemble the hegemonic sort of power that's in place in society. Um, so kind of interesting stuff going on there. But I think it all starts at Heidegger with the sort of emergency of being. And, and so maybe in terms of like what we might lose if we were to pull Heidegger's work completely out of philosophy, I, I think Agamben is really indebted to that stuff and, and we would lose uh, some very meaningful work on that end. Uh, not that we can just pull the rug out from underneath Heidegger's, uh, you know, uh, contributions at this point, but yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting connection. Um, so in, in my recent book, Time and Trauma, I draw more on Hannah Arendt right. um, as somebody who I think is, you know, she was Heidegger's student and, and also mistress for a while. Um, I was going to say, I was going to ask you about Hannah Arendt and their love affair. Yeah. Yeah, well, Heidegger fooled around with a lot of women, right. <laughs> actually, <laughs> um, including several students. But um, but she takes that idea of sort of radical novelty and self-expression and creation that, and urgency that you find in Heidegger, but but tries to maintain a space for a democratic a democratic public. So. Um, she she makes some useful distinctions that I think Heidegger didn't make between um, what she calls work, which is kind of, kind of building a space, building a structure or a place or, or a society, versus action, which is what you do once you've got that society and once you've got that space. Mm. Um, that's where politics actually begins, according to her. Um, it's not about building, it's about saying things and interacting with other people in a way that's unpredictable and is not a matter of making people do things or controlling people. It's about becoming somebody together uh, in this messy democratic way. So um, that that is much more appealing to me. Gotcha. So um, you mentioned you wrote a book about Heidegger, like a Heidegger and introduction that's more for beginners than the book that I uh, I'm still making my way through is Time and Trauma, Thinking Through Heidegger in the 30s, but I, I understand you've written quite a bit more. Um, what are the other books that you've written? Um, so my other book on Heidegger is called The Emergency of Being, which is my phrase, um, came out in 2006, and it's 2006, and it focuses on one of these posthumously published texts uh, called The Contributions to Philosophy, uh, which is just very opaque. So I took it as a challenge and tried to tried to make sense of it. Um, I've also published something that's not pure philosophy at all. It's called the typewriter revolution, oh, a wow. typist companion for the 21st century. So that's a big hobby for me. I use typewriters and collect them. And, uh, I think they are a form of resistance to digital hegemony. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and I've, uh, co-edited an anthology on the task of philosophy in the Anthropocene where okay. we and contributed a chapter to that, um, you know, what's the meaning of this ecological turning point and what do we need to be thinking about now? Wow. Well, I, I this entire conversation um, has been fascinating and wonderful to have with you. And again, like these are very loaded, complex questions I've, I've chosen to ask you. And uh, you certainly fielded all of them uh, in a way that I don't know that I can get out of many guests. So I'm, I'm, I owe you a debt of gratitude for coming on the show and talking with me in your time. And, uh, and, I, and for listeners, uh, uh, Richard is surrounded by typewriters, uh, uh, right now. And I, and I meant to ask you about that, but, um, I, you know, my mother is an English teacher and, uh, you know, obviously I, I study a bunch of philosophy and things and I'm a writer. Um, but at some point I will inherit my mother's like, uh, underwood typewriter from like the 1800s at some point and uh so typewriters are are fascinating things and uh the more that i uh you know the more that i write i find this sort of urge in the back of my head that's like this would be a lot easier if you just had a typewriter dude you know <laughs> well right well you're right of course and uh, <laughs> so i encourage that and uh thanks for all your good questions this has been really enjoyable